welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this section, we'll conclude our discussion of mitral valve disorders focusing on mitral valve prolapse. Please note the clever little picture of a mid systolic click and the drawing of a ballooned mitral valve leaflet. And now the click and ballooning are gone. What happened? Where did they go? Seems the patient became supine and now the click has miraculously disappeared. If you can understand and or explain this phenomenon, you are halfway there with mitral valve prolapse. And just to beat it to death, like I do all things, I snuck in this introduction on cardiac maneuvers. In the first instance, our patient was standing upright and the LV chamber was relatively empty, so it was easy for the valve leaflet to prolapse. In the supine position, however, the LV chamber by virtue of lying down, has increased venous return and thereby distension or pull on the chordae tendinae. Voila, the click disappeared. I know this is a stupid introduction, but this is how the game is played. In my clinic, if I have a young palpitator, I simply have the patient stand while auscultating out at the apex. As a provocative maneuver for mitral valve prolapse, it is unbelievably rewarding. And we remember this slide. We are still at the mitral valve. We are still at the apex but there are a couple of important modifiers. First, you will note we are now talking about a sound, not a murmur. That sound will be described as a click occurring during mid-systole. That is unique for sure. No overlap or confusion here. And we finally arrive at the maneuvers, which I will destroy in this video. Go get some coffee and come back in an hour, or better yet, just hit the mute button. This overview, my fellow citizens, is the language of mitral valve prolapse. And just for context, here are the three disorders affecting the mitral valve, stenosis, regurgitation, and prolapse. Recall from a regurgitation video that I mentioned mitral valve prolapse can have a regurgitant murmur described concurrently. This is because the valve doesn't just click and prolapse, but it is also associated with an element of incompetence. So don't get confused by the description of a late systolic murmur heard following the click. And here are the key features. We have valve leaflets that prolapse but are also described as floppy or ballooning. The right graphic demonstrates this phenomenon. As already stated, we are still at the apex. A click will be described and mitral regurgitation may also be present. And then comes one of the main derivatives. They will present a vignette with features of mitral valve prolapse and inquire about the pathology. The buzz phrase is myxomatous degeneration described by attenuation of collagen and elastin with deposition of mucopolysaccharides. This is a pretty classic description that you should be familiar with. Insofar as provocative maneuvers, you will need these to make the diagnosis. They won't test you on the maneuvers themselves. So here are the likely patient scenario. The first is a patient with Marfan. I've also illustrated the Marfanoid features in a patient with MEN2 syndrome. In both instances, a click will be described, and if they inquire about mitral valve prolapse, most assuredly the pathology derivative describing myxomatous degeneration will follow, or possibly an inquiry on the fibrillin mutation associated with Marfans. Certainly Marfans has its own set of derivatives, but they are a major demographic for mitral valve prolapse questions. The second scenario depicts a patient with subacute bacterial endocarditis. The pathophysiologic emphasis is the notion of infection on a previously damaged valve. Whereas this is fair game, I haven't really seen these questions as mitral valve prolapse patients are now considered to be at low risk for SBE. Ding, 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 here's the big money. This is a classic NBME demographic slash stereotype the ever popular young woman with chest pain and palpitations. And this description is very real in the patient with mitral valve prolapse. They do have an increased incidence of atypical or non-cardiac chest pain. There is no physiologic basis for the pain. It is just an association. Likewise, palpitations are commonly reported. It is unclear, however, whether the patient with mitral valve prolapse has an increased risk of dysrhythmia compared with the general population. For purposes of the boards, however, don't scratch your brain too hard sorting out the basis for these findings. They just are. The prolapse patient will be reported with chest pain and palpitations. They are just used as demographic descriptors. So if they give you a young woman with these symptoms, who is also probably a 35-year-old school teacher, they are setting you up for a mitral valve prolapse question. What kind of question? Probably choose the most likely finding on the physical exam, the mid-systolic click. And finally, we'll take our first crack at the exam maneuvers. Although discussed here with mitral valve prolapse, they are major players in the patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as well. And here is a little teaser question for purposes of orientation. Remember, our goal is not to just fill the LV chamber, but to maximally distend the chamber. 
Go big. So which of the combination of options will take the empty chamber on the right and fill it beautifully as depicted in the left graphic? And the answer is D, squatting and isometric hand grip. In both maneuvers, we are increasing end diastolic volume. The hand grip does so by increasing afterload. My favorite maneuver, squatting, increases both afterload due to the physiologic stress of squatting and also increases venous return. So squatting is the surest way to fill that chamber. Valsalva and standing both decrease venous return. And the way to envision what is taking place is to focus on the chordae and their attachment to the valve leaflets. On the right, you can see a depiction of chordae appearing lax. This permits those degenerative valve leaflets to more easily balloon or prolapse. Focusing now on the left graphic, we see a full chamber depicting tension on the chordae and thereby anchoring or securing the leaflets in place. This depiction is meant to give you a functional understanding of how the maneuvers mitigate the auscultory findings. And although I am highlighting the chordae, recall the underlying pathology is myxomatous degeneration. Let's not confuse the two. Here is just another drawing depicting the maneuvers, but I want to re-emphasize that both squatting and isometric hand grip also attenuate the murmur associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In fact, if they even allude to a maneuver, more likely than not, the question answer will either be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or mitral valve prolapse. And here is a summary I made for myself. You are encouraged to draw one of these out and have a reminder flashcard for yourself. So here are the travels through the mitral valve. First, we reviewed mitral stenosis, which is trickiest to the bunch due to the variety of derivatives, including altered hemodynamics, the association with rheumatic fever, and complicating atrial fibrillation. Then we had a good time with mitral regurgitation, focusing on the major topic of endocarditis and introducing the cardiac pathology of myocardial infarction. And our discussion concluded with mitral valve prolapse, focusing on the characteristic demographic presentation as well as physical exam maneuvers. And now you can take mitral valve off your bucket list, which is very funny because I use a bucket during the maneuvers. And as always, if you have any questions or concerns about any of the material covered or just life in general, please email me at 12 days. Thank you.